We have only one earth. Our living planet that helps sustain life. We are warned this life system is in crisis. Fresh water, clean air, good soil, the things we need to stay alive are being destroyed. Sustaining the environment is something we all have a vested interest in. After all, who wants to pollute the water or the land? Everything that you and I use comes from the land. Food is grown or raised on land. It also provides the materials used in everything, ranging from cars and tools to clothing and silverware. Property is also essential for a family to build their home. Sustaining our environment has led us down the road to a movement known as environmentalism. Yet, a strange thing happened. Environmentalism came to a fork in the road. And while the rhetoric took one route, the agenda took another. America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. This great land was founded on individualism. We as citizens have God-given rights. We even passed the Bill of Rights to protect them. Since the beginning, our forefathers understood that people were endowed with the right to property. They state, private property and freedom are inseparable. Property must be secure or liberty cannot exist. Our forefathers knew the dangers of big government and how it can threaten the rights of the people. They overthrew a government that told people what to do in critical aspects of their lives. For the first time in history, a document was created that protected the rights of citizens through limited government. We as Americans have the God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For generations, Americans have fought to protect our great land and freedom. Today, the fight not only continues, but expands to many areas, including our environment. As good stewards of Earth, Americans are traveling on the road to environmentalism. Recycling has been a common practice for most of human history. One of the first big pushes occurred in the 1970s through government mandates. As time passed, environmental protection went from a local phenomenon to a worldwide movement. Saving planet Earth became a common goal. This goal took shape through the United Nations. Beginning in 1983, the United Nations asked the World Commission on Environment and Development, also called the Brundtland Commission, to propose long-term strategies for achieving sustainable development by the year 2000 and beyond. By 1987, in the name of preserving the food supply and clean water, sustainable development was introduced. Director General of the World Health Organization and Vice President of Socialist International, Gro Harlem Brundtland, led a commission that released a report called Our Common Future. In it, they define sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It sounds like something we can all support. After all, who doesn't want to preserve the land for future generations so they can have clean water and plant and reap their harvests?
As sustainable development took shape, other issues within the UN progressed. In 1992, an Earth Summit was convened under the auspices of the UN to formulate policy for the World Environmental Movement. At the summit, they issued a report entitled Agenda 21. The number 21 stands for the 21st century. In his opening speech, the General Secretary of the summit, Maurice Strong, who is also a member of the Brundtland Commission, said, Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. It sounds as if sustainable development is taking on an agenda that can possibly curtail one's eating habits, the ability to drive using any type of vehicle, and even limiting one's ability to own a home in the suburbs. What are their true intentions? At the conclusion of the Earth Summit, in the euphoria of the moment, Agenda 21 was signed by 178 world leaders, including President George H.W. Bush. Since then, subsequent events have led American leaders, including Presidents Clinton and Obama, to sign further agreements and executive orders implementing Agenda 21. Environmental activist and attorney Daniel Sitars states, Agenda 21 proposes an array of actions which are intended to be implemented by every person on Earth. Effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced. A major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals, and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This kind of government control may sound inconceivable for a country like America, but in June of 1993, President Clinton issued Executive Order 12852 to create the President's Council on Sustainable Development. The purpose of the PCSD was to translate the recommendations set forth in Agenda 21 into public policy administered by the federal government. Now this begs the question, what UN mandates are being funneled through the federal government to our local communities? So now, let's see how Agenda 21 is affecting the United States Bill of Rights and Constitution. In the UN's 1996 publication, Global Biodiversity Assessment, it states, property rights are not absolute and unchanging, but rather a complex, dynamic, and shifting relationship between two or more parties over space and time. Agenda 21's view toward private property can be traced back to the 1976 UN Conference on Human Settlement. In their Report of Habitat, the private ownership of land section reads, Land, because of its unique nature and the crucial role it plays in human settlements, cannot be treated as an ordinary asset, controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. Private ownership is also a principal instrument of the accumulation and concentration of wealth, and therefore contributes to social injustice. If unchecked, it may become a major obstacle in the planning and implementation of development schemes. This is contrary to the views of George Washington, John Adams, and the other founders of the United States. Agenda 21's view on private property is comparable to that of the Soviet Union, where private ownership was replaced with collective ownership. To explain, let's look at the first actions taken by Vladimir Lenin and his Bolshevik government. Following the October Revolution of 1917, 
Agrarian land reforms did away with the people's private ownership of farms. The farms were seized and converted into government-mandated collective farms. On these collective farms, the ruling Soviet government determined production quotas which are similar to what is being recommended by the PCSD to bring the rates of harvest into line. With the guidance of UN affiliates, sustainable development programs have found their way into local communities. A good example took place in Contra Costa County, California in 2011. At a meeting to explain sustainable development, the following took place between the organizers and the citizens. An attendee did not understand what was meant by preserving open space. So open space is sort of defined as anything that does not currently have development on it. So it would be defined as, uh, as agricultural areas or natural areas that, are, that don't have uh, urban development on them, either industrial, commercial, or, are you or housing. Are government open space or are you talking about private open space? People's private property, like eminent domain. It's, it, it, it's both. Both? After much confusion from the citizens, a woman stated, Private property. Part of the that's part of our constitutional values for people to have and be able to do whatever they want with their own private property. And for us to sit here and say they can't use their own property and you're calling it open space, open space is somebody's private property. These types of meetings lead to more questions than answers. What are the true intentions of sustainable development? Private property rights are only one aspect of sustainable development. It affects an even more fundamental aspect of life, life itself. Let's look at the Chinese Communist government and its one-child policy. Just like marriage in China, there are numerous hurdles to overcome before permission is granted. For a Chinese couple to have a child, they have to get a birth license. In order for the couple to get a license, they have to go through a procedure that runs through local Communist Party functionaries. Without a birth license, no hospital or doctor can treat the mother or the child before, during, or after the birth. The Chinese are required to inform the authorities of any illegal birth. In short, the Chinese government is in complete control. Since China is one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, it has a great deal of influence on UN policy and how they view population control. China's one-child policy is now being considered as a viable solution towards sustainable development. The PCSD shows their support of this very idea in their 1998 publication, Sustainable America. We must move towards stabilization of the U.S. population and a reduced rate of population growth in the United States and the world. Sustainable America also promotes Agenda 21's view on education for sustainable development. We must expand the number of curricula, materials, and training opportunities that teach the principles of sustainable development. Generally speaking, it sounds as if the UN is altering children's school or college curriculum to improve the quality of education. On the surface, this sounds very positive, but is something missing here? What exactly are they changing, and how is this going to be implemented? Looking at the big picture, how is this directly affecting us and our individual freedom? It extends into many areas at state levels. One in particular is recommending large-scale training of new government workers to enforce sustainable development. A good example is taking place in Madison, Wisconsin. In the publication, Building a More Sustainable Future in Wisconsin, it emphasizes the importance of state and federal training and education programs to generate educators, facilitators, and motivators who would be capable of going into individual homes and helping people develop their own personalized sustainability action plans. 
This sounds as if, for the good of our communities, we can look forward to trained government employees entering our homes. How will this directly violate your freedom? Agenda 21 is much more than private property, population control, and education. It affects nearly every aspect of your life. The following is a partial list of what Agenda 21 also promotes. Relocating people from rural areas to cities. Higher gas prices. Manipulating transportation patterns. Forbidding human access to land. Seizure of private property. Restricting the amount of water use. Additional taxing. Restricting the amount of waste. Forced community involvement. And the list goes on. In support of saving the earth, affiliates of the UN have continued to expand into local communities through programs known as Local Agenda 21. The main organization that local governments join to be part of Local Agenda 21 is ICLE. ICLE stands for the International Council for Local Environmental Initiatives. Founded in 1990, it was established when more than 200 local governments from 43 countries convened at its inaugural conference at the UN. ICLE states that it provides technical consulting, training, and information services to build capacity, share knowledge, and support local government in the implementation of sustainable development at the local level. ICLE has begun to entrench itself within the United States. As of today, the U.S. has by far the most local governments involved in ICLE, exceeding 500. In three clicks, you can find out if your community is a member of ICLE, the UN affiliate. Go to ICLE.org. On the top menu bar of the website, click on Members. On the left side of the column, click on Global Members. Here, you will see countries listed alphabetically. Scroll down to the United States of America to find your city or town. If you don't find yours, look for others in your surrounding areas. Now, to verify that ICLE is part of the United Nations, do the same as before. Go to ICLE.org. On the top menu bar of the website, click on Program. Scroll down and click Agenda 21. Upon clicking on Agenda 21, you'll be redirected to the official UN webpage for the United Nations Local Agenda 21. Citizens all over the country are beginning to wake up to the problems with Agenda 21 and its sustainable development. Americans are taking back their communities one at a time by dropping ICLE membership. For example, in Edmond, Oklahoma, a small group of concerned Americans took action. They created a plan that would inform key business leaders and influential citizens about the dangers of ICLE. Within time, the mayor and city council were persuaded to vote to drop ICLE. So as you can see, it not only can be done, it is being done. To discover how you can get ICLE out of your community, visit the Stop Agenda 21 page at jbs.org. This will give you the materials you need to learn more. Once informed, you can learn ways to tell others about the dangers of sustainable development. And finally, we encourage concerned Americans to get involved and take action. Samuel Adams once said, the liberties of our country, the freedom of our civil constitution are worth defending against all hazards. And it is our duty to defend them against all attacks. Regardless of your political affiliation, we are all individuals with freedoms and unalienable rights. We are all Americans.
questions asked the World Commission on Environment and Development, also called the Brundtland Commission, to propose long-term strategies for achieving sustainable development by the year 2000 and beyond. By 1987, in the name of preserving the food supply and clean water, sustainable development was introduced. Director General of the World Health Organization and Vice President of Socialist International, Gro Harlem Brundtland, led a commission that released a report called Our Common Future. In it, they defined sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It sounds like something we can all support. After all, who doesn't want to preserve the land for future generations so they can have clean water and plant and reap their harvests? As sustainable development took shape, other issues within the UN progressed. In 1992, an Earth Summit was convened under the auspices of the UN to formulate policy for the World Environmental Movement. At the summit, they issued a report entitled Agenda 21. Yet, a strange thing happened. Environmentalism came to a fork in the road. And while the rhetoric took one route, the agenda took another. America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. This great land was founded on individualism. We as citizens have God-given rights. We even passed the Bill of Rights to protect them. Since the beginning, our forefathers understood that people were endowed with the right to property. They state, private property and freedom are inseparable. Property must be secure or liberty cannot exist. Our forefathers knew the dangers of big government and how it can threaten the rights of the people. They overthrew a government that told people what to do in critical aspects of their lives. For the first time in history, a document was created that protected the rights of citizens through limited government. We as Americans have the God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For generations, Americans have fought to protect our great land and freedom. Today, the fight not only continues, but expands to many areas, including our environment. As good stewards of Earth, Americans are traveling on the road to environmentalism. Recycling has been a common practice for most of human history. One of the first big pushes occurred in the 1970s through government mandates. As time passed, environmental protection went from a local phenomenon to a worldwide movement. Saving planet Earth became a common goal. This goal took shape through the United Nations. Beginning in 1983, the United Nations, the number 21, stands for the 21st century. In his opening speech, the General Secretary of the Summit, Maurice Strong, who is also a member of the Brundtland Commission, said, Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class, involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban housing are not sustainable. 
It sounds as if sustainable development is taking on an agenda that can possibly curtail one's eating habits, the ability to drive using any type of vehicle, and even limiting one's ability to own a home in the suburbs. What are their true intentions? At the conclusion of the Earth Summit, in the euphoria of the moment, Agenda 21 was signed by 178 world leaders, including President George H.W. Bush. Since then, subsequent events have led American leaders, including Presidents Clinton and Obama, to sign further agreements and executive orders implementing Agenda 21. We have only one Earth, our living planet, that helps sustain life. We are warned, this life system is in crisis. Fresh water, clean air, good soil, the things we need to stay alive are being destroyed. Sustaining the environment is something we all have a vested interest in. After all, who wants to pollute the water or the land? Everything that you and I use comes from the land. Food is grown or raised on land. It also provides the materials used in everything, ranging from cars and tools to clothing and silverware. Property is also essential for a family to build their home. Sustaining our environment has led us down the road to a movement known as environmentalism.